From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, automotive designer Henrik Fisker. With Gina Grad on news, Paul Bryan on sound effects, plus a review of Wonder Woman 1984 and her ray for Baldywood. And now, the breach on the Capitol today is the most disgraceful thing to happen in Congress since he testified there. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The choice, we're getting on the mandate. You get it on now. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for sharing, right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball burn. I'm going to toss you salad, bitch. Yep. All right. Kayla to the rescue. Getting dropped from the show. I'm uh, excited to hear about your uh, review for Wonder Woman, which is coming up in uh, Bollywood uh, soon enough. Uh, so there's uh, breaking news. There's the breach on the Capitol, which is uh, happening right now. I just kind of caught a side glimpse of it uh, running around in between uh, podcasting over here. So Max Pat Max Pat has more of the official particulars. Yeah. So and I know Brian's been watching the news lately too. But it's uh it was after a, a march uh, march for Trump. Everyone uh, stormed the Capitol, or a lot of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol. Um, they've they've been able to get past the police and a breach. Uh, Congress was evacuated. Mike Pence was evacuated. Uh, as of now, there's been tear gas, gunshots, and it's and Trump has been tweeting, "Please stay peaceful." Um, but yeah, everybody seems to be unanimous with uh, it being very shameful and, and disgraceful. Well, um, and a woman's been just... shot. She's in critical condition. Not clear if she was shot by, uh, you know, agitators or by the Secret Service. But it has officially gotten violent. Uh, the, it, at, the, the protesters were attacking the police with flagpoles. Hmm. Ironic. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is uh, I uh, I blame the major airlines. <laughs> because, uh, as I've said, Naturally. once we uh, stopped dressing for uh, flights and started wearing flip flops and cut off sweatpants, uh, that that began. That was the first. That was the pulling of the thread of the sweater of the yeah, fabric the of society of yeah. diplomacy. Yeah, and now it's just kind of game on. Also, uh, I've been talking for a long time. This sort of breakdown of the rule of law, like. Cops don't mean what cops used to mean. When we grew up, cops were cops. Now cops are kind of a suggestion. You know what I mean? That kind of used to be a rule. And uh, we saw it on the left with the whole Black Lives Matter and a lot of the protests, or I should say a lot of the looting and and violence and all that kind of stuff. And now we're seeing the right version of it, which is a bunch of dudes uh, showing up and uh, forcing their will on our, our society. And I don't know, <clears throat> you know, I don't know where this ends because the problem is the message has gotten out that the cops are just kind of there, but they're not what they used to be. I don't know. Maybe we need another Kent state type situation. Maybe the, maybe <laughs> the national Christ. guards got to open fire on a crowd or something. I mean, it is true that, when when the shit goes down, um, the states and the cities that just do the sort of show of force, like the uh, you take like Beverly Hills, you know, Beverly Hills right in the middle of Los Angeles. Uh, there's stuff going on to the east. There's stuff going on to the west. You know, there's stuff going on in Santa Monica. There's stuff going on in Los Angeles. But there's never anything going on in Beverly Hills. Because Beverly Hills goes, they don't play. yeah, we um, we got Larry King living here. <laughs> He's compromised. And they just, they go, fuck it. We're doing show of force. Like, we're not doing a, you know, a stand down. Let's not agitate. You know, this sort of thought is, let's not agitate people with this strong force or having the National Guard or having the cops show up. Let's not escalate, agitate. Right? Let's no, not, not yeah, we're going to escalate things because, but... Right. I would argue that when the cops stay home, then it just escalates by itself. Sure. It, goes, it goes unchecked. And if you right. take a look at a lot of the places that did do the show of force, then the looting and the burning and the rioting uh, was either n- null and void or at least kept to a, to a minimum. So, and the people who didn't have that have Chad or Chaz or Chop. Right. Or they have Whatever Chaz and, and Chop. That's so, right. So either way... 
I do think from this day forth, forth we're just going to need big time show force everywhere all the time. So just from what I've observed on you know, Twitter, social media and stuff, I think that's what a lot of people are, I'll just say, confused about, which is you would think the show of force you're talking about would come from the federal you know, officers or the, or the D.C. police, people protecting the Capitol, the Capitol building, for God's sake. You know what I mean? Like this is where this is where the, 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 the soft bullshit ends and the show of force begins, at least in, in my mind. I'm like, yeah, well, you can't fucking storm the Capitol building. The National is in there. The National Guard is on their way from Virginia, and I, I'm sure neighboring places. Right, but, but how many hours yeah, they were not are we they as were as under speak? prepared for yeah. today. So why is so the- I think, Adam, what you're saying is correct, but I think what's confusing is this is where the show of force should should originate, right? There should be the tip of the spear. I agree, but I also feel like when you know everyone's heading down to Santa Monica, we need the same show force there. I mean, burning down businesses and stuff like that. We just it just needs to be the new world order. But I agree, uh, you know, the Capitol building is more important than a pottery barn. But either way, <laughs> not, either way, the rule, <laughs> debatable, debatable. the rule of law just needs to be the rule of law. Mm. Uh, so we need that force, whereas maybe in the past we, we didn't need the force. I'm curious on how the National Guard works, because every single time the shit goes down, they have to call in the National Guard, but it's always from somewhere else. And yeah, my, Where do they originate from? I'm saying, like, if, if the shit goes down in Virginia, do they have to get the National Guard over from a neighboring state? Or there never seems to be their own National Guard. Mm-hmm. Or it's always we're waiting for the yeah. National Guard to, uh, to move in. D- deploy. To deploy. All right. So uh, we'll keep you posted if uh, anything, go- anything more goes down with that. But uh, it, uh, other countries, no. especially Russia and China, they just have to be laughing their fucking asses off, right? Oh, it's the best they, day of their, of their lives. This right. is so humiliating. <laughs> this is the, this, this Gina, is I, don't so know about, humiliating. I don't know about you, Gina. This is the shit that I would come home from school from, like in middle school, and see on the news, like, yeah. oh, there's blah, blah, blah going on and blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, shit, man, sucks to live there. Like, this, yeah. is, this is, I imagine that's happening in other countries oh, as we speak. They've got to be dying laughing. I mean, this is, this is really embarrassing. All right, so uh, we'll keep you posted on that. And uh, also breaking news, uh, the animated Canadian TV show Caillou has been canceled. Oh, more important. Don't bury the lead. I know. After tw- <laughs> I told, I argued with Chris. I said, we do Caillou, and then we do the uh, people storming the state house. Yeah. But he... I don't know. They, he just made a. He, he just kind of uh, made, called an audible. I get one yeah. one topic to really insist on a year, and I wasted it already. But yeah, it's a real, it's a real OJ Michael Jordan situation. <laughs> yeah, this is this Caillou thing. Uh, this cartoon has bothered me since I was aware of this cartoon because it's a it's a whiny little fucking weird cartoon that PBS I guess has been running for twenty years. It's also out of. Quebec French or Canadian. French Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Again, whenever it's kind of like when you pull up on a car and it's got a whole bunch of weird shit on it and you kind of go, Hmm, I wonder what the nationality, I wonder who's driving that car. And yeah. you're, you're never surprised when you pull up. It's never a middle-aged redheaded woman. It's always mm. something. And uh, <laughs> something, uh, Adams. something other. Yes. It's never Amy Adams. And Caillou, <laughs> I always thought this cartoon is fucked up. I don't know where it comes from, but it, it cannot come from out here. It must come from somewhere else, and it's uh, out of Quebec because its color palette is weird. Everyone is super white. The lead looks like he's, you know, three or four cycles into chemo, and I don't even know what the fucking message is. It's kind of a, it's kind of what you get without the competition part when you end up on PBS with uh, this. It's why a piece of shit like this gets a 20 year run. But I used to watch it. It'd be on with my kids, which would would, would always be a, a bizarre thing for me because I'd have to watch Wow Wow Wubsy or uh, Caillou. And while my kids were being at, at age two and a half or three were being marginally entertained, I was always being enraged by right. how bad this uh, this art was. So you got the article there, uh, Max Zapata, but. I think I forwarded it to you. Uh, Someone tweeted it to me today. 
But uh, Caillou yeah. is, is dead in the water. Good. Yeah, it's a deadline reported. Caillou canceled by PBS, and parents couldn't be happier. <laughs> That's great. Yes, I uh, hope all the craters of Caillou, I hope someone translated that into fucking French and they're now all considering suicide. By the way, yeah, because I've been uh, I've been looking at social media and it is it is pretty crazy how many people are really just rejoicing over this TV oh, yeah. show that's been been on this long. It's like, can I please can I, I'm sorry, can I please read one tweet that stood out to me in mm -hmm. uh, in reaction to this? Somebody said. First major win of 2021 is Caillou finally being canceled with his stupid bitch bald headed ass self. So that's how people feel. Yeah. So in the article, they were basically explaining that uh, it was kind of teaching their kids how to whine and be a puss yeah. and get stuff by <laughs> nagging everybody. Yeah. The article says that it's long been a target of complaints by parents who claim the show taught their kids how to be whiny and bratty. And social media erupted with several viewers celebrating news of the cancellation. Um, there's one person said Kai was one evil ass MF mother effer. And, uh, and then it showed a uh, video of Kai, like pulling a baby, tugging on a baby's cheek very hard. Uh, another wrote, okay, but why did Caillou's parents never tell him to shut the fuck up when he had those stupid tantrums? Oh my God. My mom would have thrown me out. Also, it was like s the least creative show ever because everyone's name, grandpa was called like old person and you know policeman was policeman and ever and no one even it, it, it was so fucking uncreative it, it, it is at the top of my pyramid of the people who say uh you know the heroes that say we're doing things for children we're creating art for children we're creating program for children and then it just being a complete and other utter cop out like just just bereft of anything creative whatsoever and of course you can fucking entertain a three-year-old. You can, you could entertain a three-year-old with a popsicle stick and some fucking keys and they're, Easily. they're True. delighted. And if you yeah. showed them Borat, they'd be bored off their ass. So obviously <laughs> it's easier to create shit for kids. So, uh, see you in hell, Caillou. Yeah. That's what I have to say. <laughs> I also if read. Caillou's supposed to be so great. Why does it say in its Wikipedia, friendly and curious, Caillou discovers as much fun and wonder as any kid can imagine. Mm. Yeah, no, there's none of there's Bill, no fun. Yeah, and he could imagine it's not it. as advertised. <laughs> also, I'd like uh I would like a children's series called uh Bobby the Uncurious. Like uh <laughs> his dad would come in the room and go, You wanna know how the pyramids were built? And he'd go, I'm cool. Can and that'd be the end Sunny, of the Sunny the Uncurious. That'd be the end of the episode. <laughs> no, Sonny is uh very curious. He's not curious about race cars. He's not curious about building. He's not curious, uh, curiously or, or the about the Tucker Carlson van shows up. About he's not. Yes, he's not curious about any of the stuff I like. But he does sit around and stare at his phone all day and explain to me who got traded and who got oh, yeah, drafted and who's uh, the leader in the fantasy, you know, sports and you know rattles off stats uh, all day long. He's definitely going to make some uh, woman. And potentially a man miserable when he's older, because the only thing that hate the only folks that hate this kind of shit, all the stats and all the sports more than the ladies are the gays. So yeah. this is going to be lose lose for him in the uh, Any in, way you turn, in yeah. the partner uh, department. I uh, speaking of profiling, I got my hair cut yesterday and I. I had to do my own profiling, which is, I said to uh, the Porcelain Punisher, Matt, I said, uh, find out if there's any possible haircutting places open anywhere in my, my neighborhood, anywhere around my house. And uh, he said, okay. And then he checked with all the sports clips and the super cuts and the fantastic Sam's and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, uh, all of them are closed. But there is one place that's open. Mm. And I thought to myself, what is this one place that's open? Because obviously it's not like they have, you know, it's not like they pulled a permit and got an exemption. They're just open. And right. all the other places are closed. Quietly. Right. Mm. And, you know, not so quietly because he got them on the phone. I mean, he 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 checked yeah. into it. And uh, and. <clears throat> 
and he f- figured it out and uh, made the appointment. And sure enough, I went there. But I kept thinking to myself, what is different? Like, hmm. why why were six places closed, but the seventh is open? And then who are these people? Like, what is this place? Why are they defying the rules? Why are they open? How come they've taken an appointment? And as soon as I walked in, I, I had my answer, which is like, off the boat, Korean. Like, they're just like, Korean woman, fuck it. I got to make money. In. I'm putting yeah. the hours in. I'm not fucking going home and waiting for some uh, government cheese. I'm putting the time in. But it did, uh, much like the profiling and the uh, car and uh, Caillou, I, as soon as I walked in, it, 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 it all just snapped into focus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple of calls up here. And then, of course, uh, Baldywood, which I'm, I have heard uh, almost nothing about Wonder Woman. Really? Almost nothing. Okay. Um, I also, I don't think people in general want to go out and tear it a new asshole because that's sort of a hate crime. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I don't expect it, 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 everyone loves the idea of Gal Gadot and Wonder Woman and the sure. strong, the first strong one was very well received, yeah. strong woman, you know, in the in a superhero department. So we'll get to that in a second. First, uh, interesting question, which I don't think we ever really have gotten to from uh, Carlos in uh, Riverside. Carlos, Ace Man, hmm, how you doing, sir? Good. What's going on? I wanted to take on this as I'm driving through town. I've noticed a lot of university license plate frames, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, University of Laverne, UCLA, USC, and it's always on like a 2010 Honda Civic with the cloth interior. It's never on something you want to drive. So if I'm the dean of a university, is that how, is that how I want my school represented? No. What do you think? Um, well, Brian, Brian can attest once you're done paying off USC, that's probably all you can afford. I was going to say, <laughs> once you get to the point where you can afford the nice car, you know, the, the university pride is slid off a little bit. <laughs> do they now, if you're a contributor or donor, like alumni donor, do they, do they give you a license plate frame? Like, is you're it asking like, the wrong guy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like KCRW, give him a hundred bucks. They give you a mug. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I kind, I kind of wonder if there's that. Yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> Ask Tony Reed. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's, it's never a band. He always says it's UCLA. Never something you want to own. Yeah. No, I, I, you probably don't notice it when it's on a Mercedes, to be fair. But I, I agree. Well, it's kind of interesting. So let's see. If you are driving around a brand new loaded Lexus, then the world sort of knows you're probably educated, you're doing okay for yourself, and uh, maybe you have a field of expertise. Um, but if you're driving around a, a, a knock-around Honda Accord, then maybe people think you're a loser. So then maybe you want to put the license plate frame on that said you graduated from Pepperdine to try to counteract the Bondo on the fender. <laughs> Right. Jesus it's much Christ. cheaper just to get a license plate frame. It also kind of makes you wonder what percentage of those cars are actually alumni graduate, like actually graduated yeah. with Why a degree. Get those frames? Yeah. And then also I kind of feel the same way about when they put the license plate frame on from like Galp and Ford. My thing is, is like I'll put the license plate frame on from Galp and Ford you can drive off the lot in this brand spanking new uh, Ford F-150. But every year I'm going to come check it out. And if I find like you've got a mattress in the bed that's rotting <laughs> out. A shopper that place. <laughs> yeah. And there's a big crease in the front fender and there's a bunch of fast food wrappers rolling around on the dash. I'm going to go ahead and take that yep. off. Yep. And not, not only am I going to take it off. But I'm going to show up with a frame that says Gaudi Replace Ford it. on it. That's right. That's right. That's BMW right. of Monrovia. <laughs> That's right. All right. Let's see. Uh, thanks for that observation, though, Carlos. Out of way, sorry. A quick follow up. As a car mm. guy, what is your take on license plate frames, from plain to 
I wouldn't say decorative. You know what I mean? Like, is there any, is that even, is that lame for car guys? I, Proud I mama bear at Colfax yeah, I, I, Elementary. I figure, yeah, I figure the cutesy ones are kind of lame, but like just even a plain one, is that looked down upon by car guys? I don't like any advertising going on. And I don't mean just for a dealer, but advertising about yourself. Yeah, the proud mm -hmm. mama bear and all that stuff. But the license plate frame, when done correctly, will finish off the back of the car. Like the license plate itself is just stamped and it's got the four holes in it. And if you just put it on with the two or four screws, it'll look a little unfinished if you're driving a Ferrari or a Aston Martin. As a matter of fact, when I took my Aston Martin to Chip Foose, famed uh, car detailer or sort of car uh, fabricator, uh, he actually fabricated me up a finished chrome license plate frame Ooh. that went around the back of the license plate on the back of the car because he realized it would finish it off nicely. And um, I have put them on many cars to give the finished look, but it's always a uh, matte black or chrome or something. And it's always kind of streamlined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. Got a question about uh, my mom. There's another question about question. the uh, Senate building and uh, Josh 43, Las Vegas, Josh. Ace man. Yeah, man. Bald. Gal, Gal, mm -hmm. Gal Gadot. I mean, Gina Grad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shalom. Yeah, I, oh, I, I should be so lucky. I, oh. I've never seen anybody look uh, so similar as uh, Gina Grad and Gal Gadot. It, you know, uh, thank Christ amazing. she's hot. Oh, oh me and Caillou. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take it all back. I'm right. sorry, Brian. Sorry. You're offending thank Greg you. Brady uh, and Caillou with these comments. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Going around the license plate thing, by the way, I, I live out here in Vegas, and I did see a um, a fairly nice car, a uh, Mercedes uh, 550, whatever those are, sedan, with the a very nice version of the ass, grass, or gas, no one rides for free. Mm. And I was like, I was like, is that the sign of a lottery winner or a jackpot winner? So it, how else would you get those money. two worlds to collide? Yeah, mm. and it, it literally said that on there, right? Yeah, but it was like a, it wasn't a cheapo one. It was like a like they had put some effort or hired a custom guy. It was laser a etched. custom guy to make it. <laughs> yes, I am a uh, platinum, but it was nice. I am bothered by the bedazzled ones, the jeweled ones mm. you see on the ladies' yeah. cars. Yes. Sometimes that bothers me. Uh, also, here's an interesting uh, conversation. Um, now, we all know there's a vetting process for um, vanity plates. So yep. you couldn't right. write B, G, C, O, C, K, right? You just, no. they, they'd go, nah, you can't do that. <laughs> but Guy back, loves the Bee Gees. <laughs> back in the day, if you would go to Disneyland <laughs> or Knott's Berry Farm, you could get a custom engraved license plate frame. They had like the plaque of plastic at the bottom. Yeah. So what if you went into the kiosk at Spillican Corners in, um, <laughs> in Knott's Berry Farm and you said, I want one that says, fuck the Jews. Would that guy have to talk? Kalen, you know what to do. <laughs> would he need to speak to his manager or would he just enter it in the engraving machine like it was anything else? I think there's a there's got to be a Interesting. process. All right. So uh, yeah. we'll have to get to the bottom of that as soon as uh, Knott's Berry <laughs> Farm <laughs> reopens. I feel bad for Knott's Berry Farm and, uh, and for that matter, Magic Mountain because – Every single conversation, like, why can't Disneyland reopen again? And, uh, you know, Magic Mountain's right. got to be going like, fuck? hey, Hello? what the fuck? Hello. We're fun. Kids We're come here. Fun. They enjoy yeah. it. We enjoy People enjoy themselves. Uh, all right. So what was your question, uh, Josh? Yeah. So I've listened to you since the Loveline days, and, and you got me through college and, and high school there. But one piece of the, the Ace Man history I just can't fill in is, you talk about the times your mom was in the bedroom yelling freak out and, and basically barricaded in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then you jump ahead to the fact that she's remarried and uh, talking a uh, hot brand muffin talk. And I would guess happy with your stepdad. And yeah. how did you, how did she get out of the bedroom? How did, I know Ray unfortunately told you how they met, 
but unfortunately. How did, how did those two worlds meet? Well, I, I, I think Ray finding out how they actually met does kind of shed some light on this question, which is she was very depressed, probably locked herself in the bedroom a lot. I don't know that she was sad to see my dad go, um, but, um, and I'm not even sure if he went, uh, but she did end up in a primal scream therapy encounter group at some point, probably tired of punching her own pillow, wanted to go mm-hmm. find a, you know, pillow at a, at a different location to punch and uh, scream about Second how much hand. she hated her mom. Yeah. So that's where she met my stepdad. So it makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. It's sort of like saying, uh, well, your mom was such a heavy alcoholic. How'd she meet her second husband? And the answer would be AA. AA. Like she went somewhere. <laughs> and uh, that's that's where they met. I've, you know what? Yes. Can I jump in on that? Because this is also something that just doesn't. It, it's, you know, like when you like there's a TV character that's known for like, you know, just always being, you know, a curmudgeon or grumpy. And then they have like that soft moment. And you're like, oh, OK, that rounded them out. Now, it's all I needed was to see that episode. That's your mom because low resting pulse, only resting pulse, never gets off the uh, bed or the, you know, the, the mattress <laughs> on the floor. And yet she got it up to leave the house to go to a primal scream therapy session she had to get uh, so much energy to scream like that and to punch pillows yeah well she had that quality you want in a mom which is uh virtually no talk and no communication and then at some point wild banshee ass screaming <laughs> sobbing and punching pillows so it's that uh, yeah, flying to extremes the is, yeah is the consistency you want. okay she was yeah. a lot like when you see an alligator and they're just floating there and you're like is that a flying log and, and that thing hasn't even moved in a year and whatever and the next thing you know it's on top of the toddler and dragging him right. down yeah. into the into the spinning mire it. Yeah. spinning it death roll right that was kind of my mom what you're I looking see. for is a little more day in and day out consistency gotcha. i think so she did have that uh, yeah. that mode. But uh, thanks, Josh, and thanks for listening. Thank you. All right, let's see. We got another uh, Senate building discussion. Patrick, uh, 38, Virginia. Get that National Guard out there. <laughs> yeah, Ace, man, you got it. Big fan, Gina Bald. Bald, thanks for the health update, man. I don't think your uh, performance declined at all. Wow, but, second um, one in as many days. <laughs> I've been DMing these people to oh. call in. <laughs> hey, Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Venmo you after. You got it. Hey, Ace Man, I want to know, you know, you always say all roads lead to narcissism. And we have all these people breaking into the Capitol, committing felonies and live streaming it and taking selfies. I just want to hear your thoughts. There were a lot of phones in the air. Oh, there were. They had they had the the the, the camera, oh, excuse me, the footage people streaming in there. There were a lot of phones being held aloft. Yeah, I well, I feel like Unless you're filming it, it's like it's not happening. Right. It's kind of like what the great uh, War- Warren Beatty said in the uh, Madonna doc, Truth or Dare. Remember that? No. Come on, Gina. I, Come on. I cannot remember. I can, sorry, I can't quote Warren Beatty accurately from Truth or Dare. Well, I'll, I'll paraphrase, but like somebody said like when Warren was like standing there and and I think they were in the dressing room or the hotel room or something like that. And, um, Madonna, I think it was after Madonna was told like not to talk. She had to write everything down or whatever, whatever, whatever that was. Um, I do. All right. Max Pat is not, uh, he's not getting my hand gestures here, but, uh, which spot is it? We got, uh, you can look at the screen. I got check the, uh, check the rundown. Steel. Please. Uh, right, the point is this, um, Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty, like somebody said to Madonna, like, well, if you can't talk, do you still want to film or some version of that? And, um, and Warren sort of chimed in and said, uh, why do anything off camera? Like he was kind of, it was a jab at Madonna. Like right, sure. if, if she's not, if she's not being filmed, then it's not happening. Essentially. Not like she's not, she wouldn't do anything without being filmed. I think that was the, the bloom coming off the rose. You know what right. I mean? Like, uh, Warren, 22 years, her senior or 30 years, her senior had probably been there and done that probably had an older version of Hollywood, 
where people like a little more discreet, you know, and off the record, off the record. Back then, he's talking about a an absolute superstar, global superstar. Now he could be talking about any one of us, any one of us plebes. Right. So uh, that is uh, that is the all roads lead to narcissism. And of course, if you get to the end of that doc, you'll get to the part where her assistant went out, partied uh, in some city. They were doing a gig in, came home, uh, passed out and woke up the next day with like a bloody rectum. And all they did was make fun of her. Another thing that probably wouldn't happen today. No, not on camera. (laughs) Certainly wouldn't be on film. It's funny. Madonna seemed to skate, seemed to breeze by that whole part where her assistant was roofied and anally raped <laughs> and then came back to the four seasons and they're that all jolly old time. They're all calling her a sucker and making fun of her. Uh, it, it was weird. Um, but that's when I fell in love with Madonna. Just yeah, got in sense. that window where you can do that. <laughs> yes. Well, if anything, if we haven't learned anything else today, can we please all just see that there is no difference between groups? There's no right, left, whatever. Everybody is nuts. Everybody films themselves. Everybody stampedes shit that isn't theirs. So yeah. let's stop pointing the finger. They're all just humans and they're doing what humans do and various manifests itself in different ways. But uh, yes. All right. Let's see. We got. Um, b- 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 we got a Bollywood uh, coming our direction. First, I'll tell you about uh, Crossropes, the perfect time. Jump start that your uh, New Year's fitness goals. Get Crossrope and uh, get that jumping with your feet, man. Exercise classes are difficult. Man, I'm people, every gym, I think every gym in California is closed, right? There's no going to the gym out here at least. That's correct. And it's tough to fit stuff in your schedule. Uh, you can do it in just 30 minutes with cross rope. They got patented weighted jump rope system. It's uh, I don't know if anyone other than me has used a weighted jump rope, but it is immediate. You can feel it immediately. It is sort of you 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 get the benefits of uh, weightlifting when you're skipping rope, but you also get the cardio and uh, you also get to work on the rhythm. You're not just kind of standing there throwing around the dumbbells. Uh, free anytime access to workout routines and fitness challenges with cross rope and you can track your workouts and map your progress. They got a 60 day risk-free money back guarantee. It's a great product. I use it. It's Crossrope, right, Dawson? Jumpstart your 2021 fitness journey with Crossrope. For a limited time, save $50 on Crossrope's most, most popular jump rope fitness bundle at crossrope.com slash Adam. That's $50 off a Get Fit bundle at crossrope.com slash Adam, A-D-A-M. All right. Uh, we got Baldywood coming up with the much-anticipated uh, Wonder Woman. We'll do that right after this. And now, another honorable mention from the cutting room floor from the 2020 Ace Awards. Outstanding achievement in shitting on a point shitter's point, Erica. Hey, Erica, 56, San Francisco. Yeah, what's going on here in San Francisco? We are giving free alcohol, cannabis products, and cigarettes to people who are in the hotels that we are handing over to the homeless people. Are they allowed to smoke in the room? Because if I smoked in a hotel room, I'd be arrested. They are. It's it's uh, it's allowed. It sounded crazy, but uh, I'm reading a USA Today article from you today, ironically. Conservative nonprofit Turning Point USA posted a meme to Facebook alleging the policy misused tax revenue uh, when, in fact, uh, the uh, San Francisco is uh, providing them with private donations. So still crazy, but not uh, taxpayer uh, paid. It is taxpayer because the Department of Public Health is the administrator. They did receive private donations, but the city is doing the actual work in order to make it happen. So they tried to back away from that fact. I'm a reporter and I did a story on it and uh, it got pretty convoluted. Well, either way, whoever, mm. whoever's paying for it, is, it seems like... Well, we are. The 2021 Ace Awards coming this December. I like all these uh, snippets that hit the cutting room floor. This is awesome. And with, uh, you know, 10,000 hours of content, there's bound to be a few floating around out there. All right. Uh, Should we do the intro to Baldywood? (laughs) 
Hooray for Bollywood. He will tell you if a movie's good. Brian will review the flicks that he's seen upon the big screen or in his Netflix queue. Before you spend bucks, remember his taste sucks. He loved that train wreck piece of shit, Transformers 2. Hooray for Bollywood. Wonder Woman, 1984. Wonder Woman 2, essentially what mm-hmm. it is, but it takes place in 1984. Hence the title is a 2020 film released uh, Christmas Day, I think, on uh, HBO Max. It's a, it's a Warner DC, you know, in the Batman universe. Uh, and they made the deal with uh, HBO Max, so all their... I think all their movies are going to come yeah. out on HBO Max mm-hmm. for at least a limited run. This one, I think, goes for a month. I think you have until the end of January to watch this one. Directed by Patty Jenkins, starring Gal Gadot, Chris Pine, Kristen Wiig, who we'll get to in a second, because I have thoughts on that, and Pedro Pascal as the uh, de facto villain. Um, it took me a couple of sittings to get through this. This is a two-hour and 30-minute movie. That's it's fun. very long. Uh, and it took me a couple of settings to get through this. And I posted a very long, well, for me, a long thread on Twitter yesterday. I take notes on every movie I see. Every, every movie, if it's, if it's in the theater, I'll do it afterwards. But if I'm at home, I'm just taking notes and I have to try and remember things or, oh, this was good, this was bad, blah, 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 for Bollywood and Film Vault and whatever. Um, and my notes for, I, I kid you not, my notes for. Wonder Woman were exclusively questions like what what is this why is this what is happening and I posted the thread and Chris emails me this morning hey I saw your thread you want to do Wonder Woman and I'm like not really <laughs> the movie's a mess like it's it's hard to follow it's 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 not well made or constru- it's poorly conceived so this Bollywood will similarly be a bit of a mess. I'll just bring up some things that might spark some discussion. Um, Chris, give me, a, the, give me a give me a Rotten cogent. Tom's uh, number. It, it opened. Oh, at, I, I got it here. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, I don't have the audience score. Do you have the audience score, Chris? Because it's sixty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so on the precipice of uh, rotten and fresh. Fashion. But it's been falling quite a bit. Like I think it it debuted at like. 80 or it debuted 70? at 88, there. dropped oh, to 60, well, and uh, uh, audience right now is 74. Hmm. Mm. All right, wanting to like it, yeah. I mean, it's what's a big action tent poly movie, so a certain, a certain percentage of our you know idiot populations back, like, well, oh, things are blown up, this is great, when in fact, it's not. Um, yeah, stream on HBO Max, okay, so. It opens with a 10 minute, I timed it because I was, I was bored enough. It opens with a 10 minute sequence of young Wonder Woman on the island of um, Lesbos or wherever she's from uh, doing a, like, it's like a nine year old girl doing a, like, kind of an Olympics, kind of an American Ninja Warrior. Kalen, if you have the footage, this is, yeah, there you go. There's, there, there are people running and doing American Ninja Warrior shit, but. Are we to the point with CGI now where this is supposed to be impressive? Like, I, I'm, I'm watching people fly through the air and do impossible things and, and jump off of horses. And I'm like, is this, am I supposed to be impressed by this? This is, there's nothing new here that I haven't seen. Like, where are we with CGI? Well, like you said, we literally see this on American Ninja Warrior. People can do things like this. And you said Lesbos. Uh, it's close, but Them- Themyscira? Is that the world? I have no, they never. They don't think they name it. In All this right. Movie. Well, that's what the uh, that's what Wikipedia says. Uh, I do know the name of it, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want you guys to think I'm an asshole. That's probably so. good. Say it. <clears throat> so we get ten minutes of this of of the little girl being the hero, and I'm like, right, I guess I'm supposed to be impressed by this. And then it's followed up. Kaylin, you can stop this. It's followed up with a three minute. This is hard to describe. A three minute. Opening scene back to modern day, 1984, where the film takes place, of a bumbling jewelry heist inside of a mall that uh, 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 Wonder Woman like foils, like she foils this jewelry heist. Mm -hmm. This is the plot of like Superman 2, like they want to get the kryptonite or whatever, like Mm -hmm. she she foils. It's just part of the the great Muppet caper. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there, and, and there, there is, it. She's just beating up these people with no, you know, she's completely invincible, whatever. And then after the first three minutes of the movie where we see Wonder Woman kick some ass, how long do you think it is until we see Wonder Woman on the screen again? 
Well, I'm guessing Wonder Woman in the Wonder Woman outfit. Yes. With golden right. lasso so golden and everything. Golden of course, is in the movie. As, yes. You know, Diana or whatever. Yeah. Well, I imagine because of the way you're phrasing the question, it's a long time. 65 minutes. Wow. An hour passes. What? An hour passes before we see Wonder Woman again. I'm sorry. Who is I this can't movie watch, made for? I can't watch Clark Kent for 65 minutes in a row. 65 minutes of exposition. We get as much of the bad guy as we get. And he's whatever. He's completely disposable. An hour of expo- of talking. Wow. Nah. <laughs> before, we, before we get to the end. By the so the only advantage, most sequels are bad, right? Most, most sequels just aren't as good or they're bad or whatever. Let, can I say this? Uh, let's just hope this director never turns her attention to porn. Because uh, <laughs> so much expository that dialogue. would be difficult talking to the pizza guy in the doorway for uh, 44 minutes before the blowjob. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So the advantage that a sequel has, the one advantage is don't have to worry about exposition. We know who these characters are. Let's get right to the ass kicking. Even a bad sequel is going to have a lot of action. This one goes an hour plus before you see Wonder Woman on the screen again, let alone kicking ass. Um, There's there's a, there's a, there's a, a compilation on um, YouTube that's simply titled Wonder Woman 84, all fight scenes. It's four minutes and 52 seconds long. In a two hour and 30 minute movie, there's five minutes of ass kicking. Well, what, do you think in a, in a world that I've complained about, which is whenever they do the sequel to action movies, they just hit the ground running. Like the whole thing yes. is, is they go, there was 31 minutes of actual fight scenes in the first movie. We're going to double that because mm-hmm. yep. it's the sequel. That's the formula. And the and the and and it oftentimes loses me. It's it's kind of the jaws. Like in Jaws 1, you didn't see the shark for a long time. In Jaws 2, it starts with the shark. Right. You know what I mean? And they think it's better, like more shark, more excitement, right. but it, maybe they overcorrected did they go too far the other direction and not trying perhaps. to go down that road? Yeah, perhaps the movies you're talking about, and I was thinking about this, was like, I'm like, well, an hour without action is a good in The Shining. It's good in Jaws. These are slow burns by master filmmakers. This is an hour of boring, confusing exposition. It's something about the stone they're looking for, the, the stone that was like stolen in the original heist. It's like a wish stone, so if you wish for something while you're holding it, your wish comes... It's a fucking genie in the lamp. Like This, right. this is the plot of the movie. Um, <laughs> now, 88% out of the gate, at least, with the uh, Rotten Tomatoes. If this thing starred John Cena... John Cena <laughs> as Wonder Woman. That would be <laughs> you, think, you think you get to 88 out of the gate with the critics? No, I think they were like not. rooting so hard for this movie before it yeah, came out. I think so. And I think it's, it's course corrected. Like it's going to end up as a rotten movie. You know, a few more bad reviews come in and it's going to cross over to the rotten area. It's not the worst movie I've ever seen. And it's not a disaster. It's just long and boring and messy and confusing and, not interesting. Um, so Kristen Wiig is potentially really interesting in this movie because she plays this nerdy, uh, mousy uh, co-worker of Diana's, right? And like she ends up, minor spoiler here, but she ends up uh, making a wish with the wish stone and becoming kind of a bad guy superhero. Mm-hmm. And I could, I, I, at one point I wrote down, like, was this originally conceived as a body switch comedy? Because she, she wishes to be more like Diana and she ends up becoming sort of, this twisted, you know, Wonder Woman type character. I'm like, that could have been interesting. That would have been something worth pursuing. But instead, she's just kind of blah villain. It's just, that's, we that's, did the that. Poorly conceived at every angle. Which Superman was it? Where he's bad Superman for about half the movie. <laughs> the the worst one. Yeah. Superman for. Yep. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna uh, uh, put up can a I picture. Just ask you, oh, God, Hulk, 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 really Hulk Hogan did yeah. that already, by the way, as well. Oh, that's right. Uh, that's that's right. So. Everyone on Facebook couldn't wait right around Christmas, right after Christmas, to talk about how how bad this movie is. One man, one man who stood alone and said, you know, this is actually a really good movie, and I think everyone who doesn't like it is a misogynist. Could you please speak directly to him, Brian? Is that me? No, you didn't say it. Oh, Somebody on Facebook said, oh, you everybody speak to that who person. said this, they're right. just misogynist. This was a good movie. 
Okay, I don't see how anyone could say this is a good movie. I can see how people would say this is a satisfying movie because it's two and a half hours of tentpole CGI. And mm-hmm. if that's what you're into, like if that's like I want to see Wonder Woman fly around the screen for, you know, a part of the movie, then you're satisfied. But it's there's no way this is a good movie. Um, Got it. Also, I feel like we've evolved as a society. There's so many good movies that have female casts and action and everything else, uh, all varieties. I, I think we're at a point when a movie's good, people call it good. I, right. uh, I would hope so. Uh, <clears throat> You're certainly going to get the woke, uh, you know, percentage of critics. But this has like 370 reviews. That's a lot of reviews. You're just going to get a certain percentage that you want, want to be on the right side, like you said. You know, they want so badly for this to be good when, in fact, you know, they're, they're swimming against the stream. I think there's probably a higher percentage of woke critics than there would be hater critics for the, you know, the woke critic is off because not necessarily with Wonder Woman, but let's just say any woman. The woke critic says, eh, the movie's not that good, but it stars a gay black yes. woman of color or whatever. So I'm going to give it some points. And then there's the hater yes. critic who goes, I'm not going to give a good score to anything that stars a black woman or something like that. But I think there's a higher percentage of woke critics now. A good um, example is like The Help, like which I didn't like. I thought was pretty either. was pretty uh, melodramatic, but but it had everything going for it. It was about you know indentured servitude, or, you know it, it was about the right things, and it was a mm-hmm. loving book, and it, it, it had everything I found going for it, it. Offensive, and I couldn't believe. I was like, I thought it was The Emperor's New Clothes. Yeah, so I'm so glad you agree. Lot. What is The Help at on Rotten oh, it's be. Tomatoes? Eighty. It'll be high, and then the people will be lower. Max Pattis says he turned off Wonder Woman after 25 minutes. Couldn't do it. I, I was watching. I was so bored. Even that mall action scene, the opening action scene that's it's supposed so to be It's so incompetent. Like, she's just kind of, like, tripping guys. Yeah, it, it's awful. She And then she does, like, a wink to a kid. Like, it's kind of goofy. The whole tone was just was just so different. I loved the first one. I was really excited when this one came out because I was really happy with the first one. Why change it? And then... Um, and then, yeah, so I had to watch The Dark Knight Rises to get that taste out of my mouth and uh, watch a real yeah. superhero Palette movie. Cleanser. Hey, can I, po- I'm going to point out three more things. We got time. And Adam, I thought of you, I thought of something you say a lot. Put up the picture of the president because this takes place in 1984. Uh, their president is a character, a prominent character. He mm-hmm. appears in several scenes. Mm-hmm. And they have, okay, it's, it's, it's your example of either be out past the breakers or be up on the beach. Don't be getting pounded by the surf. It, we're looking at the president. This looks enough like Ronald Reagan that I'm right. like, is this supposed to be Ronald Reagan? Yeah. But like, and then people are online like, no, 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 he's credited just as POTUS or whatever. And I'm like, okay, he's, the guy's not doing a Reagan impersonation. However, could the credit, the filmmakers have just gone with a blonde president, a gray president, a bearded president, a female president, a black president, anything but a guy who looks a little bit like Ronald Reagan? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I notice it in the, all the commercials and in any other production as well. And yeah, like you probably can't do a black president or a female president because it's 1984 and yeah. we sure. go, we wouldn't but be. just to eliminate all confusion. Yeah, well, no, have a guy with a beard or have a bald guy, you, you know, or, or anything. So you're not asking all the time, like, is that person that person i it, it always bothers me when they have someone in a movie even if it's just a person that looks like another character in the yep. movie and you go is that that guy or is that his is that brother the same guy? yeah all right so Kayla, uh, well, not put up put up the picture of the gunfight because immediately after we meet the president there is a full-on gunfight in in the west wing like outside of his office we never see more than five secret service uh, All that, right. That, that that's the entire fight right there. This goes on for five minutes, but uh, we never see more than. It's just that kind of movie. We're like, what? Why the fuck are they doing this? And finally, I want to. I want to. Th- this bothered me. There is a. Um, you can play the 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 truck sequence with uh, Wonder Woman just underneath what I'm talking about. There is a scene in the movie where where Wonder Woman has to. Uh, you're gonna see her. She kind of. She's being. Uh, she's laying siege to a truck, a moving truck. They're speeding down the highway mm-hmm. in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, they're opening fire on her. Oh. And she is going to go under the truck and uh, do a very nifty move where she goes under the truck and then spins around and blah blah blah. I'm thinking to myself, it's 2000, 2000, 2021. 40 years ago, 
also in Cairo, Egypt, was oh. one of the greatest, switch over now to the other scene, was uh-huh. one of the greatest, greatest stunts ever committed to film in Raiders <laughs> of the Lost Ark. Right. When, it, when Harrison Ford and a stuntman literally went under a moving right. truck and circumvented right. the truck. We have devolved. The, the last 40 years are a de-evolution in film. We, 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 to quote Jeff Goldblum in uh, Jurassic Park, we spent so much time wondering if we could, we never stopped to wonder if we should. Yes, CGI has allowed us to see incredible worlds and incredible things and aliens and monsters, but now we are literally devolving from one of the greatest stunts ever committed to film to, I don't know what I'm watching with Gal Gadot underneath a truck and like throwing it in the air. Yeah, you know, it kind of strikes me with CGI is when it gets too fantastical, then it kind of, and yeah, it's a great Raiders of the Lost. This is an incredible, this scene. is the most incredible, uh, one of the most incredible action sequences ever filmed. Yeah, you know, the stunt sequences. It, it strikes me that with the CGI, it's like, I don't know, uh, paprika or something and, and and sprinkle it in small doses put a little bit over the deviled eggs it's good Paragon. you don't want to just eat it right out of the jar mm-hmm. and sometimes like when we're looking at the opening sequence of uh, the young uh young wonder woman doing the obstacle course and stuff you, you kind of tune out because it feels all cgi'd and it feels mm-hmm. all sort of or or when a movie gets too like sort of fantastical the best uh you know, the best use of it is when they're, I was just watching, um, I don't even know if it's CGI. Like you watch, I was just watching uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, last night, which I, yes. I, I enjoy. you're wondering, are they using CGI? Yeah, like I, I enjoy it more and more every time I see it. But like when Brad Pitt throws Bruce Lee into the side of the car yeah. and it dents in the, the caves in the side of the Lincoln. It's like, obviously someone got on a computer and had to kind of make that happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but the fight scene before it didn't have any of it in it. It was just used sparingly Mm -hmm. like, uh, like, like uh, Vin Diesel uses nitrous oxide. (laughs) You, You gotta do the race. At some point, you can flip the, the you can hit the hit the bottle. At some point, you can give a shot of the nitrous into the manifold. But you stay on it too long, or you get too happy with it, or you use it too often, it blows up the engine. So uh, <clears throat> the help seventy six with the critics oh, and eighty nine so with the people. I'm surprised that people wow. like it more. I I have not seen the help, but uh, more popular with the uh, people. All right, Brian, you ready to bring it home? Or yeah, I'll more leave. Takes? I'll leave it with this. Someone tweeted me like, "Oh, is it worth getting uh, HBO Max for this?" I said, "It is worth getting HBO Max. That it's a great service, a lot of great docs and movies. Not for this, uh, but there will hopefully be better movies on the horizon." Dawson, hit the outro. Hooray for Bollywood! All right, uh, great designer Henrik Fisker is. Uh, we'll talk to him in a few. He's got a new, very interesting SUV that uh, he's uh, behind. He did the Karma, famously, but he's also done a lot of work for BMW and Aston Martin. And as a matter of fact, I think he worked on the uh, Aston Martin uh, DB9, which I have. And I'm going to ask him this question. Could potentially be insulting. I don't know. We'll have to get to it. But there's a very interesting thing. So I got the first year Aston Martin DB9, right when it came out. And I took it to Chip Foos, who does all the automotive stuff. And uh, Chip looked at it. And and I said, I want to do this and I want to do that. Just a couple things on it I don't really like, like the side markers in the back and the license plate light. It'll sort of look kind of part spinny or something like that. So he said, I'll, I'll breathe on it. And one of the things I, I never asked him to do and I never thought to do was on the side of the car, there's like a, 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 there's like a gill for a breather on the side of the fender. You can probably find a picture of it. And there's a chrome strip. There's just like raised chrome strip. And it's like eight inches in front of the door going to the front of the car. And then it carries over onto the door. 
but it was only like two inches long. And uh, Chip Foose walked right up to that, and he went, the part on the door is not long enough. And I said, oh. eh, I'm not really interested in that part of it. And he said, I am. It's wrong. <laughs> and he just went over, and he made a new strip that was five inches long instead of two inches long. And when I got the car back from him, mine had been lengthened. The next year on the DB9, that had been lengthened. So somebody oh, tastemaker. Yeah. Now I don't know if it's a I don't know if it's a Chip Foose thing. I don't know uh, how they got wind of it. I don't know if someone just saw it and thought it needs to be fixed. But somebody saw it and somebody figured we're going to lengthen it. And it's funny, Chips has such a good eye, and uh, Henrik does as well. That Chip just walked right up to that part on the car. I was like talking about putting a scoop in the hood and stuff, and he just walked right up to that part and he went, "This is wrong." <laughs> It needs to be lengthened. Yeah, was that the one they flipped in Casino Royale like seventeen times? I think that was an Aston Martin Vanquish, but it oh. could have been a DBS. But uh, Max Apat is gonna gonna figure it out. But yes, it was an Aston Martin. I'm just not wow. sure if it was a nine, a Vanquish, or a DBS, which looks the it same. Looks like as DBS. A, actually, I'm looking on the video. Looks the same as it, the DBS is about the same as the. Uh, I'm going by nine. the description. All right, let's see. Yeah, you can find a picture of that gill from um, not my car. Yeah, the, just, like the t- 2016 design, I think, was longer. I'll, let me see if I could. Uh, I, I oh, you'd have to just go from uh, 04 to 05 or oh, yeah. 0, 04 to 07 or something like that. Uh, speaking of cars, Geico. Well, you want to get some insurance? Sure, you do. And you have uh, insurance for your home, you have insurance for. Um, for your uh, apartment, you have renter's insurance, you have homeowner's insurance, go to Geico, bundle those policies, get your automotive policy bundled with your homeowner's insurance, save a bunch of money. Just go to geico.com, get a quote, see just how much you could be saving. It's easy. Visit geico.com. Today, it's geico.com. All right, quick break, back with Gina Ball in the news right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gina Grad. Break. Viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gina Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Seek news with Gina Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. We'll talk about kicking a man while he's down. One day after Dr. Dre was admitted to the hospital for a brain aneurysm, his hilltop L.A. home was the target of an attempted burglary, and four suspects have been arrested, according to the LAPD. After a short pursuit, four suspects uh, were detained, and investigation is ongoing. So what is this about a brain aneurysm? Well, he's thanking friends and fans for his well wishes. He's, I believe, over at Cedars. Um, he wrote on Instagram, thanks to my family, friends, and fans for their interest and well wishes. I'm doing great, getting excellent care from my medical team. He went on to thank his doctors, said he'll be out of the hospital and back home soon. He's 55. He was rushed over to Cedars, and uh, he's in stable condition. They're undergoing tests to determine what caused the bleeding in his brain. Mm. Um, Maybe I'll see him around the hallways next time yeah. I'm there in the neuro department. Yeah, good series, uh the Defiant Ones or Defiant yes. Ones. I can't remember if it's The Defiant Ones or Defiant Ones. I think it's The. It always bumps me because there was a TV series in the 60s called The Defiant Ones. You guys know that? No. Yeah, there was a fairly popular network show, I think, called The Defiant Ones from like uh, 60s television. It's always weird when they come up. I feel the same way <laughs> when they buried it. They call. Uh, yeah, what was that show? Oh, is it? There's a Sydney Portier Tony Curtis. Movie. Oh, a yeah, movie. That's the movie where they're chained together. Oh yeah, is it the 1958? Def- is it the Defiant Ones? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As is the documentary. I miss movies where people were chained together. <laughs> you know what I mean? And by the way, when you chain guys together, here's how it works. Like when you're in the prison, you go, uh, "All right, we need to chain everyone together." You got to go black, white, black, white, black, white. You can't go two white guys mm. and you can't go two black guys. You got to, you need a white guy and a black guy chained together. 
so they can have their arguments about uh, oh, yeah. about yeah, race. Do you, think that. exactly. do you think that was one of the reasons they called it that between <laughs> Dr. Banter. Dre and Jimmy Iovine? Iovine? I don't uh, I don't know. It was a it was a great series, and um, I do uh, I like Jimmy Iovine if that's if that's in fact how we say his last name. I liked his uh, let me be of service to everyone and get rich versus uh, I'm going to argue with everyone and settle right. their fucking hash and not get rich. Uh, I liked his approach to life. And also, uh, I realized that the guy who ran Interscope Records was also a crazy Porsche enthusiast and Interscope ran Porsche 935s right. and Porsche whatevers. And the Interscope 935 shows up at uh at my races all the time and it's a um it's it was number was always double zero which i always i didn't know if that was a joke i didn't know if it was like the offensive lineman with the 69 but uh it was a cool car with a cool uh cool color cool color combo but it was always double double zeros but whoever the color combo uh it was like black with some uh orange kind of color on it like some white it was just a good it was a cool looking scheme if you find the interscope 935 you go oh and i would see the guy drove that car and stuff like that but the guy who started interscope i guess was a big race guy and sponsored his own 935 you got the uh, db9 gill side by side uh, so says uh, max zapata uh yeah, oh, wow. it's a little hard to see, but the top one, it's like two inches long, and oh. the bottom one, it's like eight inches long, and that's just the next year or so. So somebody figured out what Chip Foose knew a long time ago. All right, uh, well, we, we wish him well. I don't know. I have never met Dr. Dre. Don't know a ton about him, but uh, I admire his work, and I appreciate that uh, that doc, which was, I guess, a... Uh, it was a multi-part series, but I can't remember yeah. if it was, uh, it was three HBO pieces. Three-part series, I think. Yeah. Three-part. Mm-hmm. All right. It was it was pretty badass. Oh, Ooh, speaking of badass, look at that car. Look at the Interscope uh, right. 935. Red, orange, cream and black, it looks like. It's kind of badass-looking mobile, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's the same. Now, it's got it's the same as my red Paul Newman 935 when you look at it, it's just a complete different color scheme. Is that the Hawaiian trop? Thing? Yes, yes, yeah, the body really and everything's cool. the same on it. All right. Well, here's some hot goss for you. We I, I don't think we're going to be shocked that we're finally having this conversation. Kim Kardashian and Kanye West seem to be getting a divorce. A source tells Page Six they're keeping it low-key, but they are done. Kim has hired divorce attorney Laura Wasser, and they are in settlement talks. We've heard that name before. The writing has been on the wall for a while. Kim hasn't been seen wearing her wedding ring. Kanye still holed up at his Wyoming ranch where he stayed over the holidays. An insider says Kim just had enough of Kanye's mental health struggles, crazy behavior, including running for president. Uh, For his part, Kanye said he is completely over the entire family and wants nothing to do with them. Not sure if that quote includes the many children they have. They have four kids, North, Saint, Chicago, and Psalm, who's only a month old. And um, and it's it's done. She gave birth a month ago? I did not. Somebody did. Wasn't oh, somebody it might did. have been a surrogate? Oh, okay. That uh, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing about the Kardashians or the Wests or either one of them, that is a that is a you know roller coaster ride in Vegas, but that's not a let's relocate and live here full time. You know what I no, mean? Like sure. I just yeah. feel like fun place to visit. Yeah, she needs to hook up with a Mark Zuckerberg type or mm-hmm. somebody. Uh, I get that guy's name right. Uh, yeah. he, he, Larry she, Miller, perhaps. Yeah, like let's go a little lower key. You know what I mean? But that's not who they are. I mean, you don't think she marries these guys because they have a little juice and they're in the public eye? I am so naive that I, I never can understand any of it. Like, I get press and I get followers and popularity and wanting to sell product and, you know, having a publicist and, you know, doing maneuvering through the uh, Hollywood and society and you know, having your brand look like X, Y, and Z. But when it actually comes to the marriage part, it just seems like 
such a hassle if that's brand based. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, just feel like you got some kids, you're knocking on the door of 40, you're practically an attorney at this point. Just find a nice Jewish guy who's kind of behind the scenes, you know, not going to. Yeah. type. After four years, I mean, after four kids, you think maybe it's time to settle down? Yeah, who doesn't have, you know, bipolar disorder and right. just, just to kind of is not going to have wacky press conferences and run for president and think, right. you know, just a, just a guy you can count on consistent you know you know the ones i like and there's a couple of them and i'm not i mean i'm not necessarily talking about grace kelly but i like the actresses that you're like whatever happened to her oh she's a countess now in right. luxembourg or whatever yeah. you go overseas you find yourself a nice bit of royal and then you and then you just kind of have an amazing life in a castle yeah and i'm not talking yeah. Meghan markle i'm talking like off the grid like the girl from the one i'm thinking of but i know there's been more than one the girl from my so-called life claire dane's best friend okay. on my so-called life and you'll know her face when you see her she is i believe she's a countess now mm. so that kind of thing could really be the way to go yeah is, you'll know her the second you see her face what do you think if you Let's say if 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 you if if happiness was measurable and quantifiable and you could kind of measure it like you could do a blood test and see if you were 72 percent happy or 41 percent happy. What do you think like the Kim Kardashian? How do you think she'd do on that test versus somebody who had a little more of a pedestrian life in a in a schedule because I don't see I think of I think with Kim Kardashian her flying private to Europe probably goes down in her brain as a hassle now because yeah. there's probably something she has to do there or there's some someone didn't pack something or there's some it just it she, it just doesn't seem like you could be happy with that many plates spinning constantly I don't yeah. know I'll give what little insight I have uh, into this, which is under the umbrella of no brains, no headaches. I'm very close with someone who uh, went to high school with the Kardashians. Christy, keep it down over there. And um, <laughs> they're not reputedly the smartest bunch. What? Uh, and so I wonder if there's a thing where like, you know, is your dog happy? Yeah, of course he is. He has no fucking cares in the world. Yes. Like I, 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 I think there could be a um, no brains, no headache, uh, happiness factor mm. with uh, Kim and some of her siblings. Interesting. Um, by the way, the the actress I was thinking of was AJ Langer. She played Rayanne, the best friend, and she is now the Countess of Devon. Uh, is she's a, f is a former actress, notable for her role as Rayanne Graff, and now she she's a countess. So that's that's oh. the kind of life we should all uh, aspire to have. Oh, nice. And then, of course, there's the actual Countess Luann from the Real Housewives oh, of right. Manhattan. You're more familiar with her. She's yeah. Right. Speaking of dogs being happy, uh, Phil hit an all-time low. No. Oh. He, he's getting up on the counter. He's polishing off all the cookies and all the scones and all the anything that gets left on the countertop now from uh, the holidays. Took down an entire sack of Hall's mentholated lozenges. Oh, he, no. no, he has no filter. It's no. going to rip through his he's esophagus. Not, he's not discerning at all. He has no, no fucking filter. So now filter. what? He's, he's mentholated. He's yeah, mentholated. He he's not cool going to have a sore throat for yeah. 71 years. Oh, my God. I feel like that could do some, like, acidic damage. Is he going to the vet for this or he's fine? I got to tell you, all, the vet. all that shit they tell you your dog needs to go to the vet for... They ride it out. He polished yeah. off an entire box of C's candy over the holiday. Wow. What is he, me? God. <laughs> I, that's the only time I've been angry at him. Like, I fucking love yeah, C's candy. Yeah. It's the best. The almond rope the, is the, the best. The, it's all the best. It's all the best. Uh, literally got up on the entry hall cabinet uh, table, took the box, got into the box, polished off every single piece of C's candy in the thing. 
And uh, it would be so great if he left one like strawberry nougat. Yeah, one exactly. He rejected the lemon flavored <laughs> one. Well, or he does what I do, which is take the half bite and go fat, and then at yeah, some but... point circle back yeah. because you're essentially yeah. a junkie and eat the one that's you right. rejected 20 minutes ago because that's it wasn't always, good enough for you. That's always the worst move because you, because it, you're, now you're, you it's your last flavor. Now it's your last yeah. bite. You've saved the worst for last. And you have to take a good look in the mirror. Like, how 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 strong is your resolve not to eat this? And the answer yeah. is, I'll fucking eat it. Zero. I just got to get through everything else first. That's you, you know breaking what? your kid's piggy bank. You just look at the mirror. Mm-hmm. Like, what That's happens? right. I think this is very Jewish um, from what I understand. I don't know if you guys grew up around this. I hated it. My family loves it. Did you guys grow up around dark chocolate covered orange peels? Yes, I know. I didn't grow up around them, but I know. I know what you're doing, dealing with. But yeah. Jews seem that's always like a gift you bring to somebody's house. Like literally like orange rind, kinda like a jellied, candied orange peel. Oh, I thought you meant like an orange peel. Like that's disgusting. That does sound like something we'd do. But the, it's, yes. it's essentially chocolate, dark chocolate covered orange. Those flavors to me do not go together. Well, I think that Jews. Uh, they they need you know if they were just going to eat a piece of red velvet cake alone yeah. they would have to put a tack in their shoe and step on it <laughs> in between bites because we need a right. little surus you know what i mean that's a little right. pain <laughs> nothing's free nothing's that's, free that's why at the passover uh dinner table for passover you have to have the bitter herb and the salty water to remind you of the tears of the your ancestors right so you're god wonder forbid. woman was snacking on those and uh, <laughs> sure she god was. forbid you just enjoy something free and clear no. you know what i mean right. and also i think it's from the people that brought you halva which is yeah. a, essentially sand right. with honey in it in a That's in a right. brick uh yeah. who where is the origins of halva is i think it's in, it's definitely in the middle east somewhere yeah. uh it's definitely turkey india lebanon Ugh. the marzipan crowd you know what also I want to? You know I want to tell those people. I've said it many times. I'll say the same for Mexico and many of these other cultures. Uh, you know how you guys are too lame to make your own jet fighter airplane, so you buy the shit from us. Mm-hmm. All these other countries, mm-hmm. you don't make your own stealth fighter. We sell you one of ours when we're done with it. Or we'll sell you a new one, depending if you're an ally or not. But you guys aren't capable of making your own shit. But we'll make it, and we'll sell it to you. I feel like we need to implement that with desserts. You know what I mean? Hey, Lebanon, we got this covered. We don't need any more dates, sugar-coated dates. You got to drop a pallet on you with a with a with a uh, umbrella, or it's gonna be a parachute. Yeah, just floating down. Yeah, like you guys, we gave you 500 years. You came up with halva. And, you know, dates with, you know, vinegar on them or something. Right. We got a little something called apple pie. We'll bring yeah. it by. Just just pay us. We'll put it in the airplane we drop off. This How about that? Yeah, devil food. <laughs> yeah. We got all kinds of stuff. Yeah, just outsource it. It's not it's not your thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let your people okay. rejoice. And by the way, you know, this ain't a hate crime and uh, it doesn't make you Benedict Arnold for enjoying some real dessert. I, I feel that same way about uh, there's countries that can't do wine very well. Like if you ever go, like I love Hungarian food, but the fucking wine tastes like shits. It's so weird, harsh. like ox blood, whatever. And then you go into the Hungarian place and you go, uh, oh, yeah, can I have a glass of Pinot Noir? And they go, we have ox blood and we have thicker <laughs> ox blood. And you're like, Ugh. I want wine, but I don't want your fucking wine. And their thing is like, well, we're Hungarian. This is our wine. It's like, eh. This is our eh. version of wine. Is there, uh, is there a Trader Joe's in the neighborhood? Like, couldn't you guys just spend nine bucks and get in a decent bottle of Pinot and just put it in the back and charge me uh, 11 bucks for a glass? I, I could enjoy my goulash with, I'm that. with that. Yeah. I feel, uh, and, and also. I'll take it a step further. I'll go with Japanese places uh, spreading out their uh, beer menu a little or uh, mm. Thai places. You know, like there's nothing wrong with a Japanese beer. There's nothing wrong with a Thai beer. But uh, give me a couple other choices. Give me an option. That's fine. Beer in, Ichiban, and Coors. You go down to the Cheesecake Factory. They're not like, we only have beer that tastes like cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> so like, we got every fucking beer you want. You're here to Good enjoy point. yourself. That's not right. not adhere. This is not a compulsory thing. You know what I mean? You're not being judged. 
You like Pinot right. Noir at the uh, Mex at the uh, or the Mexican place, but you like the Pinot Noir at the Hungarian place, and you should you should be able to have that. Yeah. Good food, good wine. Have you guys Agreed. ever done the uh, corkage move? Have you ever brought wine? Are you shitting me? I'm sure Brian has. Dude, that's all we do. That's all you do. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but for a nice, for like a date night, or the, this is fucking 2019 and before, for a, like a night out or a nice restaurant, yes, 100%. We uh, probably 80% of the time we bring our own wine. Is, is it? A price thing? Is it is it a selection thing? How does the price thing break down once they do the corkage thing? And what is the average corkage thing? Average okay, well a restaurant tour could tell you and it depends, but it's it's generally a hundred percent. Like if you're and or more, like if it's a if it's a hundred dollar bottle of wine, you're gonna pay upwards of two hundred or more for it at the restaurant. So if we're bringing what we consider a nice bottle of wine, let's say a fifty dollar bottle of wine, we know that at the restaurant it's gonna cost us 110, 120 bucks. But um we uh if it with the corkage at say 30, 35 bucks, that's a all in $85 investment. I mean, it's not really about the saving. It's also about let's bring a wine we know we like as opposed to you're really rolling the dice a lot of the time at the restaurant. You know what I mean? They're going to mm-hmm. open a bottle for you. You don't know anything about. Uh, Max Patty, you have corkage at, uh, where'd you work at? The Panda Express? I work, well, I've, I've worked at various restaurants. But oh, uh, yeah, you're at the... Uh, TGI uh, Fridays. TGI Fridays. Mom's right. Macaron What's Grill. What's the corkage fee at TGI Fridays? Well, uh, they, weirdly, every restaurant I've worked at has corkage fees, and they range from about 10 to 20 bucks, uh, even at like nicer restaurants. So even at the Fondue Hut? Yeah. What was that place you worked? The Melting Pot. The Melting oh, Pot. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Awesome. I've decided that t- place is too good for me. It is. Because I used to pass it all the time when I was poor, and I'd go, (laughs) I could never go in there. Drew used to go all the time. Really? Yeah, he was a a big uh, customer over there. i got to talk to Drew and see how he's doing. I haven't haven't spoken to him in a couple days. The melting pot has to be one of those food services that will not survive because it's too communal. Because yeah. you're mm. dipping. Same with the Benihanas of the world. You're all facing yeah. each other, and yeah. Maybe we could fold the two businesses in together, and they could just dump cheese onto the Benihana <laughs> Grill and have everyone no, run the for their life. The cheese volcano. The cheese Pour volcano. The cheese into the onion That's volcano. actually overflow. That's good. <laughs> good name for cheese V. As Gara goes. The cheese volcano. As Gara goes about the uh, markup and the wine and the everything. Yeah. He, he's the expert. On one hand, he is. On the other hand, he'd go, hey, you got to talk to the guy to whatever. Oh, like he yeah. probably I got doesn't, people for that. Yeah, he probably doesn't dabble. But uh, all right, what else we got, Gina? So on January 5th, two days into The View, uh, co-chair Megan McCain's return from maternity leave. She and Joy got into it, and we didn't get to it yesterday. And Behar reminded McCain that there is no love lost in that relationship. I don't know if you've seen this clip, but uh, they are... They, they came out swinging. So McCain spoke up during the Hot topic segment when Behar said there's much more trouble in the Republican Party than in the Democrat Party right now, which made McCain launch into examples of all the Democrat infighting with, you know, the squad and Bernie versus Schumer and Pelosi. And that's when things got personal. Here's the clip. Oh. Mm. Bernie Sanders also coming out saying he's angry. The idea that there isn't fighting so you, within the Democratic Party speaking. as well. I, I know I you're talking. Right. I'm talking about. I'm talking okay. about somebody so much. Yeah. Joy. You Traitors. missed me so much when I was on maternity leave. You missed me so much. You missed fighting with me. So I, did I, fighting I did with not. I miss fighting. I did not miss you. Okay. <laughs> oh I, somebody, let somebody answer can the I, question. Can I weigh in? Or I'm you know what? That's moving so nasty. on. I, I'd like to that's weigh in. Like yeah. So nasty. Ruby, can I weigh in? Okay, guys. Guys. Rude. Like, hold on. Please. Hold on. Stop. Everybody, stop. Everybody, stop. That's so rude. Wow. You know when Whoopi's going, hey, ladies, get it yeah. together. It's out of fucking <laughs> control. Yeah, you've lost control. The show's gone off the rails. That yeah. show has been around for 20 years. I mean, I did that, that show. Did you, didn't you do it back in like the Meredith Vieira days? Yeah, certainly since the radio days. Our, I think Barbara days. Walters was on yeah. it when I yeah. did it. Created in 97. Wow. I mean, literally coming up on a 25 year run of that show. Wow. What could be what could be better than being on a show like that? You want to talk about just hammering paychecks and saying nothing. So was what part of the original cast? No, No, it was Rosie. 
Was oh. no. Yeah. I think Is Rosie Rose, O'Donnell the original cast? I don't know. We have to figure out the original cast. And I don't know that uh I don't know that Barbara was on full time at least after about four or five years. Wasn't there a Hasselbeck involved? Yeah, it's Joy Behar, Meredith Vieira, Debbie Matinopoulos, yes. Barbara Walters, and Star Jones. Yes. Um, they always, uh, it's, well, first off, it's kind of, it kind of, if you're the conservative or the Republican voice on it, um, it, I think it, I, I think it wears you down extra fast. It's kind of like dog ears because it's always like a three or four against one. They don't do sure. like a two on two kind no. of thing. It's kind of oh, no, like no, no, no. a it's kind of a Bill Maher set up. the target. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a spot. Hey, uh, Max Pata, you can find in, uh, in 50 years will all be chicks. I think I covered the view. Hasn't been hasn't been played in a while. But uh, I think uh, I think I, I covered Joy Behar. And my uh, take on her uh, comedic sensibility uh, oh. quite nicely covered in uh, in 50 Years Will All Be Chicks. <laughs> yeah. But also, uh, much like the aforementioned Caillou, when you're just doing shows for unemployable yentas, uh, <laughs> then the bar's not so high. You know what I mean? It's like, not a demanding audience. It's not a demanding audience. They just want to see familiar faces arguing with uh, one another. All right. I'll give you a minute to... Uh, Find that Maxipata. We we'll probably have the audio somewhere. Maybe. Yeah. So yeah, I'll love to tr- uh, scrub through it. Uh, first, let me tell you about uh, LifeLock. Increase cybersecurity attacks on pharmaceutical workers' phones and tablets as they work from home. That is a problem. They're sensitive medical data, and it could be exposed. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our information at risk on the internet. Cyber criminals around the world keep finding new ways to steal identities. And uh, you can miss certain threats if you're just monitoring your credit alone. Good thing there's LifeLock, which detects a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information has potentially been compromised, they will send you an alert. Protect yourself with LifeLock. Right, Dawson? No, we prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses at LifeLock and see threats you might miss on your own. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code ADAM. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com. Use promo code ADAM for 25% off. All right. Well, we'll let Max Apata find that uh, clip or at least that passage. And uh, Dawson can read it if you find it. And... Uh, We'll let uh, Gina move on to her uh, next story. After saying those words, giving those names, when's the last time you heard the name Debbie Matinopoulos? I just had to look her up. Remember? She was a blonde freak. A a countess somewhere? Yeah, probably. She Um, married the Prince of Lesbonia and has moved moved away. That's right. Yeah, totally forgot about her. She was part of that original five. Anyway, uh, the show's not going to go on on time, that is, for the Grammys. They've been postponed to March 14th, Pi Day. I believe that's March 14th. Mm. This year's ceremony was scheduled for January 31st, but organizers are saying there's no way. We but, can't even do this show in a scaled down, no audience way by then. What's going to change between now and March 14th? And could they not see this coming? Yeah. I mean, I think they thought they would do the no audience version, but they said that they can't even pull that off. Uh, Trevor Noah had previously been named a host. The 2021 Grammy nominations were led by Beyonce. She picked up nine. Dua Lipa, Taylor Swift, Roddy Rich followed with six nods each. But I think that's going to be, yeah, either scaled down or moved. Do we think that February is going to be just like vaccine bonanza? That's what I'm like. Is March going to be all things, you know, all, all systems go? I doubt it. I doubt it as well, but I mean, especially in Los Angeles, maybe you could have the thing in Boca Raton or something, but then Vegas. you're also not going to get, I I think the, the performers and the people that are nominated are amongst the people that are sort of most conscious of the sure. COVID-19. So you'd have difficulty getting them right. out. Right. But now's the year, if you're a struggling band, uh, this is the year you lie to everyone that you're nominated for Grammys because you just yeah. go, I got <laughs> nominated for Best Original Song and Best Original Performance, all, but it was a fucking shit show yeah. and they kept canceling stuff. Reasons. Right. And no one will ever check you. That's on right. It. All right. Let's um, do w- yeah. two more. Okay. Well, I don't know you, if you saw this. There was like some like NBC.com thing where you could see uh, in your 
county and your state and your city, what number you are in line to get the vaccine. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, oh, I, I the windbreaker I, idea is coming true. It's yeah. funny because oh, that's I how we I'm, should do it. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I think Size it's going to be <laughs> around 8 million people before me. Oh, really? 8 million. So, I mean, and I, I, you just put in your own stats, it's you know, like, what your age is. It's the exact opposite of what you're looking for out of, like, the Vietnam draft, right? That's right. You would like. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Come on, 8 million. So, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is now threatening to find hospitals up to $100,000 if they don't finish their first round of inoculations by the end of the week. That's yeah, the dragging their heels. Yeah, that's going to modernhealthcare.com and a few other sources. He's blaming bureaucracy as the chief reason for these delays, public hospitals in particular. The governor also threatened to stop sending the vaccine to hospitals that don't use their supply. Meanwhile, NewYorkOne.com reports Cuomo says vaccinating someone out of the state-designated order, which basically constitutes vaccine fraud, could fine you up to a million dollars and the loss of your state license. It's another plot point from Contagion. Yeah, that's right. Cuomo's Cuomo's like, I blame bureaucracy for the inability to (laughs) distribute the vaccine. All right. I got to go. I have to create more bureaucracy. I have to hang this red tape. I've taken long enough. I've taken uh, two minutes off from more bureaucracy. So uh, anyway, I blame it. Now I got to go work on more of it. Right. Okay. I got to go be part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, Max Pat, that? It was got to be. Yeah, a... I I, it, I found it's a different order from the actual book, so it was uh, you recorded in different order. But I, I found it just it's loading up right now. Oh, okay. Sorry. One well, more. Uh, or one more, Gina Grant. Yeah, let's talk about those those games, those beloved games that become movies. Some make more sense than others. Well, we have a game, and and really, to be fair, probably more about the creator, but a movie based on the Rubik's cube is in the works. Mm. The film will be about how Professor Erno Rubik's toy became a pop culture phenomenon in the oh, 80s. the story of the making yeah. of the toy? That's so just kind of cool. The Rubik's Cube was invented by Erno Rubik in 1974, licensed as a toy in 1980. To date, over 450 million Rubik's Cubes have been sold around the world. Since 2018, amateur and professional speed cubers from all over the world have faced each other, battling for the chance to prove their skills in the Rubik's Rubik's Cube World Championship Finals in Boston. So this could end up potentially being a pretty interesting movie. I've never tried a Rubik's Cube, just like I told you, I've never played Scrabble. Because mm. my thing is, is I already know I'm dumb. I don't need a fucking punt, pass, and kick competition to prove how dumb I am. I get it. But you're mechanical and you're intuitive. Yeah, like, the Rubik's Cube might be, might be your way into the Smart Guy Club. Uh, Sonny performed a, um, he, he performed an IQ test, an online IQ test on me a couple of nights ago that he, he got 10 out of 10 on and said tilt. I got three out of 10, I think. Boy. So I'm, you know, functionally retarded. I think it puts the classification I got where he, he got like a near genius. All right, let's bring it home. Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. We have the audio clip of uh, from. Uh, is this from Fifty Years of Wallaby Chicks? Yes. And this is my take on the View. Yes. Here we go. The View. I know I'm a guy. I know I'm supposed to hate the View, but I don't hate the View because I have a dick. I hate the View because I have a brain. The View is going on what feels like its 35th season. It has numerous Emmy nominations and even an Emmy win. And it's a disjointed, scattered piece of shit that's hosted by some of the least compelling, most untalented people that have ever graced a television set. If this show consisted of five guys sitting around talking over each other with the occasional hackneyed joke awkwardly shoehorned into the meaningless conversation, it would have been yanked off the air years ago. You see, 10 in the morning, all the smart people are at work, and that leaves the Views audience. Barbara Walters is about as interesting and funny as that one old teacher you had in junior high. I know everyone treats her like she's some kind of national treasure, but she's clearly past her prime, and no one at that show would dare utter a word. It's about the same relationship Saddam Hussein shared with his co-workers. 
When she finally decides to hang up her dentures and call it a career, there'll be a silent celebration akin to what the guards did after the wicked witch got a bucket of water tossed on her head. On her last show, the lavalier mics will be recording a lot of, we'll miss you, we'll stay in touch, we don't know how we'll carry on without you. But the inner monologue will skew a little more toward, have fun on the Greyhound bus to hell, bitch. Sherry Shepard is dumb. She's read one book and it's the Bible. She's not ha-ha funny, she's more, we need a fat chick who's not funny funny. Elizabeth Hasselbeck gets a pass because she's already being punished on a daily basis. Could you imagine if your lot in life is to be wedged between Barbara Walters and Sherry Shepard? She's the lunch meat between a stale piece of sourdough and the dumbest slab of pumpernickel that ever hit the day-old bin at the bakery. Whoopi Goldberg. What happened to the unstoppable force of comedy that had us doubled over with spun gold such as Burglar, Jumping Jack, Flash, and Eddie. An Emmy for The View? An Oscar for Ghost? She deserves those about as much as Elvis deserved his black belt in Taekwondo. Joy Behar, she's the funny one. That's like saying Marwan Al-Shihi was the funniest of the 9-11 hijackers. <laughs> All right. Well, that was uh, over there. That, was, that was 11 years ago, and uh, I think it still holds true. All right. Uh, fame uh, designer Henrik Fisker, genius Henrik Fisker, will uh, join us in uh, a second. I'll uh, do a one-on-one -on -one with him. I'll uh, bid adieu to uh, Bald and uh, Gina. We'll be right back with Henrik Fisker right after this. All right. Here with Henrik right. Fisker. He's uh, joining us. He's a famous automotive designer. He's an entrepreneur. Kind of uh, on the electric vehicle thing, the boutique electric vehicle thing, sort of on the vanguard of that with the karma so many, so many years ago. Good to see you again, Henrik. Hey, good to see you, Adam. I'm fortunate I'm not the IT guy I should be, so sorry for being late here in the Zoom world. <laughs> That's all right. I'm horrible at this stuff, too. Uh, I want to get into uh, the new vehicle, the Fisker Ocean, the all-electric SUV, and where you think this... Uh, market is going and and thoughts um but let's uh let's bring it back uh to you uh and sort of your origin story you you're born where i was born in denmark and came over to the united states in 94 in the meantime i'm american and uh, lived here in los angeles for quite a while and is design always your thing is automotive always your thing is is it design first and automotive second like i love cars and i race cars but i really like the design of the cars almost as much as i like driving the cars maybe even more yeah you know i'm i i love cars and and i i wanted to be a car designer since i can remember and instead of doing homework in school and you know i was drawing cars and all my notebooks were full of cars and uh so I've just always been drawing cars. And when all the other kids stopped drawing cars and became grown-ups, I kept drawing cars. And eventually, you know, I, I went to Art Center College of Design, uh, Design School in Pasadena. And, and then I went into uh, cars. My first job was at BMW in Munich in Germany in 1989. Uh, and then you made your way to many car companies, Aston Martin being one of them. I have the DB9 which I've probably told you about before. I think it's just one of the most beautiful shapes on a car. You told me actually that you removed the uh, ugly little sight markers that we had to put for the U.S. market. <laughs> well, that was something I brought up earlier in this podcast that you obviously didn't hear because you're just joining us. But as the story goes, I gave the car to Chip Foose and I had a couple th couple things I wanted him to do. I didn't like the side marker. That's a DOT thing that the U.S. market uh, requires, Department of Transportation. I also didn't like the lights for the license plate frame, for the li rear license plate. I thought it stood out too far and was too bulky. So I had him remove a few of those things. But one of the things that I thought was interesting is I had my list of little things I wanted Chip to do on the car, but he walked right up to that chrome strip by the side gill that went onto the door. 
And he said, the part on the door is not long enough. <laughs> and I said, I'm not, that's not on my list, Chip. And he said, well, it's on my list. I'm going to lengthen it. And I thought, well, that, okay. And he did it. And sure enough, it looked better. And then I think the following year, Aston Martin came out with, you know, the next year, the DB9, and that piece had been lengthened. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Or is there any story behind that? You know, I had left by then, I believe. So, uh, but, you know, sometimes uh, there is also coincidences where uh, somebody will do something exactly at the same time, which is why a lot of times people say, how come this guy copied that guy? But, you know, it takes several years to design a car. And there is truly times when two car designers are thinking alike and things happen to end up looking similar. So let's talk about the karma. I actually drove the karma and interviewed you for a car show I did uh, way back in the day. And I was really yeah. impressed by it. I was impressed by it because, you know, back then the electric car market was sort of golf carty at best. And the Fisker Karma was low slung and sexy and had a had a very Euro kind of uh, Grand Turismo kind of Grand Touring Car kind of kind of feel to it. Uh, what year did you conceive of the Karma? You know, I designed that way back in 2007. And then, of course, we had to go out and raise money, which took forever. And it eventually got to market in 2011, which if you think back was about two years before the Model S, so one and a half year before the Model S came to market from Tesla. So we were really early out with this vehicle, probably too early. A lot of people bought the car without even knowing it had the possibility of driving electric uh, and were wondering what was that plug in the back. So it was kind of interesting because we, we caught definitely the imagination and the desire and a lot of people who were just car fans and loved the car. And uh, but it was sort of, I think, uh, the sort of first step to try and make a cool, sexy looking EV. Uh, and that's kind of sort of stayed with the brand as where we are today and what we're playing in the future. Um, was the technology good enough? Well, I shouldn't say good enough, but how far have we come from a battery? I guess it's mainly battery technology from when you were designing the Karma to designing the Ocean, the, the latest offering from uh, Fisker? No, I mean, back in the day, literally, we would walk into these crazy sort of scientific looking warehouses where some scientists were building batteries. And it was all kind of in the early days, there was really no choice for batteries at the time. The technology was new. I mean, there was really just three battery companies. There was uh, LG Kim at the time, which uh, GM had uh, signed an exclusive with. Then there was Panasonic that gone with Tesla. And then we were with a small American startup called A123. And unfortunately, as we started delivered the Fisker Karma, then they went bankrupt in the middle of the whole thing. So we couldn't continue. So fast forwarding today, absolutely. Now we got a lot more uh, experienced battery companies. We got some conglomerates in the meantime, you know, CATL, LG Kim has become huge, Samsung, uh, SK. So you now see all these larger battery companies that have had about 10 years of development. So we are finally at a point, I think it's sort of an inflection point. I think that's going to happen in the next two, three years where you're going to see electric vehicles finally coming out that has long enough range, are about the same price as a similar gas, gasoline vehicle. So I think we're finally there to see this sort of revolution happen going to as electric. Yeah, I, I think to me, the chronology or the, the trajectory would be at some point buying an electric car didn't really make sense unless you were, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and trying to make a statement, you know, years ago. It's just it, it the range wasn't there, the reliability, what have you. We're now at the point where it kind of seems like a coin toss, almost like electric or gasoline powered. And then two and a half years from now, it'll be at the point where you'd be dumb not to buy an electric car. Is that kind of what it 
feels like if it was like a graph going, it was like going uphill for the last 10 years. Now we've kind of reached the summit and it's going to start heading down, which is my kids. I have 14-year-old twins. And their first cars are going to be electric. And I'm sure their last cars are going to be electric. They're not going to know. They're going to, they're not going to know electric any more than they know a manual stick shift. Yeah, I think you're right on Adam. And I I think that, um, you know, what, what's, what's going to happen is essentially if you buy a normal gasoline car in two or three years, it's probably going to be worthless five years later. So I think that automatically will, it's just like buying a manual cheap car. You can't sell it. So what's going to happen has happened with the manual is going to go into becoming expensive sports cars. So I think we're going to have sports cars for a while. There will be gasoline cars. And I think people are going to end up enjoying them like we enjoy horses. I mean, nobody rides the horse to work anymore. They may right. still own the horse, but they don't ride it to work. <laughs> you right. Know? But they enjoy That's it. what's going to change. You're not going to use a gasoline car for your daily commute, I think, in 10 years. You may still use it for pleasure, uh, but, but not for your daily commute. Interesting. Yeah. Again, sort of like the manual stick shift. You wouldn't yeah. anybody, especially if you live like we do in Los Angeles, it would sound insane to sit in traffic with a, with a manual. Um, so is, uh, obviously as the technology goes up, the price comes down, the more companies get involved, they compete. Um, the price goes down, accessibility goes up. Where are we at? If it's all kind of was predicated on battery technology, and um, I'll give you a stupid example, but I think it's apt. Um, I used to fly model airplanes, you know, gas-powered remote control ones, you know. It's a fun hobby. And when I was doing it 15 years ago, there were a couple electric planes out there, but the battery was too heavy They didn't really last that long. And it wasn't really, if you really wanted to participate, kind of had to have a gas tank on your plane. Now, probably 80% of the market is just electric planes because it's cleaner, it's easier, it's quieter. And we have the batteries. They're not big bricks weighing the plane down anymore. So if it's about the battery technology and we've come so far in the last five, eight years in the battery technology, are we going to advance that fast in the next five to eight years with battery technology? No, I think the next sort of seven years uh, is going to be the current technology we have that will maybe have a 5% improvement per year. Uh, I think we're all waiting for the next big revolution in battery technology. And I've done a lot of research. We have you know, an internal lab at Fisker where we did a lot of work. And I, I will say, with my knowledge, I think we're at least seven to 10 years away for another big revolution. And I don't think we need it right now. You know, a lot of people right now feel like they must have a super long range in their electric car. And it just kind of comes from the fact that with a gasoline car, you never think about range. You know, whatever direction you drive in in America, there will be a gas station within 100 miles, no matter where you go. And so you kind of forgot about range anxiety. Electric vehicle is a little different. We f- have the feel of range anxiety. We feel we must have a 300 mile range. And I think that will continue in the next few years. But eventually, I think if you imagine you own two electric cars, I bet you in a few years from now, your second electric car doesn't really need to have more than a 100 mile range because when do you go 100 miles in a day? Most electric cars are just humming around in the city, doing errands, dropping kids in school. And for that, 100 miles is more than enough, but we don't feel right now that it is enough. So that's why we needed that longer range of sort of 300 miles, which we now have achieved. And, and I think all car makers can achieve 300 mile range. And that's sort of what a, a gas tank lets you go in a normal car, sort of an average is sort of the minimum in the car industry. So I think that that has sort of led to the point now where everybody can pretty much buy an electric car There are still a few exceptions, I think, if you truly are going cross country or some big trips. Yeah, okay, it's not so convenient still because you have to spend too much time charging. But I think for 80% of the population and the daily drives, an electric car is actually better than a gasoline car. And don't forget, most of us can charge our car at home. We don't even have to stop at a gas station. I just charge my car every night. I don't even think about it anymore. 
I know. It's funny. Everyone always talks about range anxiety, but the anxiety I always feel, and I get caught in this once in a while, is when I'm driving my internal combustion engine SUV home And I realize the range finder says 19 miles, you know, and I'm like, oh, I got to drive to LAX tomorrow at five in the morning. And I'm, I have anxiety, which is, I don't want to get gas tonight, but I sure as hell don't want to get gas tomorrow at four 30 in the morning. And I wish I could just plug it in and have that range obviously tacked on it. Yeah. I don't, I don't get, I, it's it's an anxiety that is kind of uh, maybe I don't know uh, maybe Americans have this more so than other cultures. We we have this thing where it's like everyone wants to drive a huge pickup truck with big knobby tires on it, but no one ever goes off road. But we want to know it's there. You know what I mean? Or people. Uh, People have a gun and they go, okay, you keep your gun in your home and then you keep the ammunition in another room and you keep the gun in a safe. And it's like, well, how's that going to protect you? Then it's like, I want to know it's there, you know? And I always say to everyone, once in a while, if you're going to drive from Los Angeles to the Grand Canyon with your family, then just rent a Denali and go on a vacation. And then when you, you're never going to do it, but if you need to do it, You can rent an SUV and then for the other 99.9% of your driving, you could just plug it in when you get home. You used to work for BMW, right? Used to work for BMW. I owned my first job, designed the uh, BMW Z8 sports car there. Yes. That was my claim to fame a bit. And that was, that was a fun project. That was a sort of throwback to the 507, if I got that right, which are two and a half, three million bucks these days, that old uh, BMW. Not a great V8 engine in that car, sidebar. But uh, the Z8s are are coming along nicely in terms of uh, they sold for a premium. It's always a good sign if you design a car, the sticker's 155 and the dealers want 275 for them when they were selling them. Then they kind of dropped off. And now they're having this renaissance. Like I, they're they're getting pretty expensive at auction these days. Yeah, yeah. I think you know when I designed that car, was I was young and it was my first vehicle, and I just went all out. And my my idea was just to make sort of the pure essence of what is a BMW. You know, the ultimate driving machine, super sculptural. The 507 was a clear sort of uh, uh, image that I had in my head and, and, and it kind of was, the assignment was how would the 507 have looked like if it would have evolved like the Porsche 911 over all these years, mm, which of course right. this kind of did. So I kind of had to think about what would, how would it have looked like? And, and, you know, nobody cared about this project within BMW when I was doing it. Nobody thought it was going to happen. So I was left alone, which is very unusual because normally there's always a whole bunch of cooks in the kitchen that want to take part of it. But in this case, I was left with a few engineers in the corner and, you know, I designed the car and by magic, it was just decided, hey, let's build it pretty much the way it was, which is very unusual in the car industry. Yeah, I brought up BMW because I went a few years back to look at their i8, which is kind of their sort of hybrid supercar thing, Tom Cruise movie kind of car. It's a beautiful car. Uh, the plug-in range was like 18 miles. <laughs> yeah. And I remember thinking, why? Why is it 18 miles? I, I want to be able to get to work and back without plugging it in. And they're like, that's the range. Um, I don't know why. And some of the cars, like the Leaf, I think may have been this way with the Nissan. Some of these cars had like well under 50 miles worth of range. And, you know, maybe it's all technology, but uh, that always seemed like a weird call to me. Well, you know, I think we're still, uh, the industry is still tackling the whole idea of electric vehicles. And I think it's divided into two. It's the traditional car industry, which let's face it, they don't really like this transition. They're kind of annoyed by it because Mm -hmm. they are producing millions of gasoline cars, making a lot of money on it. Now they have to spend all this money on a new technology they're not really prepared for. Where And that's why you have seen this 
influx of new EV companies. You know, we just went out, did a public offering, raised a billion dollars, became public. And you have seen other electric startups out there and, and Wall Street is pouring money into them. And I think it's because we can start on a clean sheet of paper. We can start from scratch and we can look at customers and saying, hey, I think they want that. Let's for, we don't have any existing customers. I don't have to worry about what they think. So I think that that's where you're going to see the sort of two different uh, variations of what, pe what, what companies think electric cars should be. And, you know, the fact is, you know, of course, Tesla is competitive to us. And, and whatever you think about Tesla, the, the fact is not, no traditional car company has yet made an electric car that has the same range as a Tesla. And they've had seven to eight years and trillions of dollars to do it. And it just shows you that when you have such a radical transformation in technology, it may not be the old, you know, famous companies that knows how to do it. Just like it wasn't Nokia that knew how to make a phone without buttons. They had, you know, hundred different models with, you know, dozens of buttons on them. But when they finally had to make a phone without buttons, they couldn't do it and they disappeared. Um, do you know Elon Musk? Do you guys talk? Do you trade recipes? How's that relationship? Well, we no, we had a big fight back in the day uh, and a, a lawsuit, which I won. And uh, since then, we haven't really spoken, but we, we did spend some time together. I did a little bit of consulting work for Tesla back in 2000, I think it was six, seven in the super early days. Uh, he's a super smart guy. But no, I, I at this point, I think we're just sort of probably fierce competitors. Uh, he's obviously way ahead in the lead. So I got a lot of work to do still. Well, let's talk about uh, the Fisker Ocean. It's a it's all electric SUV. Uh, it looks great, but let's just say I'm looking at uh, the Tesla sort of mid range. What is it? The three? I'm trying to think of what their downsize yeah. SUV is. I can't remember. The Y. The Y. The y. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at the Y. I'm looking at the Ocean. They're in the same ballpark price wise, right? Uh, so you tell me why I should buy the ocean. Well, first of all, our vehicle actually starts, I would say about $10,000 cheaper, which is quite a lot. Oh, okay. Uh, we are also, and this comes kind of back to design, Adam, where my view was that everybody who's making electric cars right now is trying to kind of make these crossover hatchbacks. And when you look at the actual market, the biggest sellers and the fastest growing market segment right now is SUVs. Mm -hmm. So. I designed the Ocean to look more like a futuristic SUV and not a hatchback. I thought that was important. And we have kind of got a lot of people reserving the car mainly because of the design. But then what we wanted to add to this was some features that nobody else has. So we have something pretty cool. And I know everybody's talking about software and we'll have a lot of software and FI pilot and all kind of stuff. But I wanted to have something that I thought nobody else have and something that could make this vehicle a fun everyday vehicle. So we created something called the California mode. And what that means is you can press a button on the screen and all the windows except for the front windscreen rolls down. Also the little three quarter rear windows, the rear hatch window and the roof opens up. So it almost feels like, you know, the Jeep Wrangler when you pull all the parts right. off, but you don't have to spend three hours doing it. You can do it in 10 seconds right, you know? or less. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that was kind of a big differentiator. Um, and then we have created something called a flexible lease. I think the new, the young generation of people, I actually still think they want a car. I know a lot of people say they don't want cars, but I think they do. But maybe they don't want to own the cars the way we did. Maybe they don't want to have all the hassle of, you know, that, that it means to own a car. So we have created a flexible lease where a young person can go out and lease our car for three grand down and three seventy nine a month everything included, all service, full warranty, and you can give it back anytime. So if you lose your job, you can give it back in, like after a month, three months, six months, it doesn't matter. So I think that's a very unique mobility solution that will appeal to a lot of the younger generation that maybe don't want to go and borrow 50 grand to buy a car. Is it start at 37K and change? Yeah, that's right. And uh, range is... We'll have several different, but the top of the line range will be over 350 miles, which I think is pretty much the segment leader. And where's the car physically assembled? So 
you know, I, I had to sort of take my ego and throw it out the window and say, okay, hey, what, what do I really want to do? I want to deliver a great car. So let's let forget about me walking down the you know shop floor and showing how great I am at manufacturing cars. I know I can not manufacture a car better than Toyota. I looked at how difficult that had been for Tesla to get, you know, to manufacture vehicles. So we decided instead to kind of take a little bit the Apple Foxconn approach, you know, where Foxconn is this big conglomerate making all the Apple products. Mm -hmm. So we went to uh, the world's third largest automotive uh, supplier called Magna. It's a Canadian Austrian company. And they're going to manufacture our car, guarantee the quality, guarantee the ramp up. And most people don't know, they manufacture, for instance, all the Mercedes g wagons from Mercedes. They manufacture BMW Z4, the BMW 5 Series, Jaguar I-Pace. So they already manufacture electric car. Um, so they're specialists in this. So we have outsourced manufacturing. They're going to start in, in Austria to manufacture in the big plant there. And then later, we might look at U.S. manufacturing together as well. And how is the dealership slash purchasing slash leasing going to work? Are you going to have brick and mortar dealers? Is it all going to be online? How's that going to well, work? Well, all the, yeah, all the purchase is going to be online or we have a proprietary app we launched, which uh, we have about, I think, a little over 10,000 people who's already put down a deposit. It's about 250 bucks. Um, and it, it'll all be online. We'll deliver the car to you at home or at your office, wherever you want it. When it comes to service, we have signed some uh, initial agreements with a group called Cox Automotive. They do service for fleets. They do warehousing, uh, logistics. Uh, so we will come and pick up the car when they need service. Because, you know, an electric car doesn't need scheduled maintenance. It's only either if you feel something is wrong or we get a message over the air that something needs service. Then we'll make an appointment with you. We'll come and pick the car up, bring a service, and bring it back to you. So uh, we, will, yeah. we will have some showrooms, you know, in some malls and some other places. We can go and, of course, check out the car, sit in it, and you can book a test drive. Because in the end of the day, a car is a car. You're going to want to see it in reality. At least a lot of people is going to want to see it. Uh, last subject, the intelligent pilot, uh, autopilot, for lack of a better term. Uh, what's this car going to have and what do you kind of think the future is with that? A lot of people have been speculating back and forth and driverless cars and things of that nature. You know, I have a different take on, on driverless uh, car, cars, you know, self-driving cars and probably most auto, other auto executives. I don't believe that fully autonomous vehicles are around the corner. Like, well, you're in a car without a steering wheel. You can just sleep, you know, while you go right. to work and all that. And the reason is that these things really only work in a perfect environment. Like, let's say you're behind a FedEx truck on a two-way street with a double yellow line. If that stops to deliver a package, and even if there's a police car behind you and he blocks the road, you would be able to break the law and pass that truck. And the police guy would probably go, yeah, I get that because that FedEx blocking right. the road. But if you can't program a car to break the law, what happens if something goes wrong and you kill a child, you know, and you program that car to break the law. So I think those are the type of things we're going to be up against for a very long time. So I think self-driving is more about creating valuable additions to the vehicle for you either to have fun or to feel safer. So, you know, like the lane keeping and all this type of stuff that you can get in cars, we want to take it a step further and we want to, take annoying things that you feel is annoying about driving. I want to take that and make it easy and you forget about it. Now, I won't reveal what it is, but we got some really cool ideas. We also have some cool entertainment ideas. One of them is I want you to be able to look on the road and see in the windscreen on a head-up display the lyrics of your favorite song so you can sing along and do karaoke while you're driving. Hmm. That would be pretty cool. And then, of course, we need to make sure the car breaks if you're not paying attention. So those are kind of more of an entertainment value. So I think that's what we want to go at, not necessarily in the pursuit of making a fully self-driving car. I think that's too far off, at least for private cars. Uh, I... Uh... <clears throat> I want to give you a plug, by the way. The website, Fisker, I-N-C, Fisker, I-N-C, Incorporated, Fisker, uh, I-N-C, dot com. And now if you go there, we can find out all about the ocean 
and uh, any other offerings from Fisker. Are you, is there another supercar in your future? Um, do you have thoughts? And, and I don't want to sling shade at Elon Musk, but uh, his electric car that was going to go 200 miles an hour, I kept saying, show me the car. Because uh, I get the zero to 60, you know, sub three seconds with electric car. That's that's achievable. The over 200 miles an hour claim seemed less achievable to me. And I also figured if they did achieve it, they would have uh, very good high res footage of them achieving that somewhere. But uh, yeah, top speed. Is that does that seem like a claim that's uh, sort of undoable today or is he, is he, can he do it? And can one do it in an all all electric car? Look, I'm a, I'm a car guy. So we definitely are going to have a supercar, cool car, uh, you know, uh, one of these days. And we have a, I have a couple of ideas up the sleeve for that. That wasn't a priority right now for us. We want to get out with an affordable electric car. We think that was more, uh, exciting and interesting, quite frankly, because I've done a lot of supercars in my life, but we're definitely going to have another one. In terms of top speed, I think it's becoming less relevant with all the rules and regulations, even in Europe, where traditionally, you know, that was important. I mean, you still have free speed in Germany, but you've got a lot of congestion. I, I think whether you need to do 200 miles now, I don't think, but I think a supercar is going to at least have to do about 150, 160 miles an hour to be real valid. Um, Acceleration, you know, yes, we can now do even less than two and a half seconds. I also think there's a point where, you know, acceleration and top speed becomes so insane that it's not even usable under any daily circumstance. And it kind of comes back. And I think, you know, that when you think back about these sort of fun cars in the 60s and 70s, I mean, they actually weren't that fast, but you could do a power slide at 20 miles an hour and have a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, today, you, if you do a power slide in a supercar, you're probably doing 100 miles an hour and you're going to get killed if something goes wrong. So the question is, can you bring fun back in cars at reasonable speeds? I almost think that's more important, fun to drive, than just the sheer speed. Uh, from your mouth to God's ears. Henrik Fisker, and uh, again, Fisker inc.com is where you go and you can listen to uh, a long form one-on-one with uh, Henrik and I on uh, take a knee this Monday. Uh, Henrik, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Always, uh, always informative and fun. Great to see you again, Adam. Take care. Last but not least, let me hit uh, Geico. Do you own, do you rent your home? Will you do one or the other? How about you save a bunch of money by bundling? You uh, take your policies over to geico.com and uh, take your homeowners or your renter's insurance along with your auto policy, put them together, and bundle them at Geico. Go to geico.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could be saving at geico.com. All right couple tickets left in Naples, Florida, off the hook. Uh, stand-up coming up January 15th, 16th, live podcast. And uh, we're also doing stand-up there as well. Almost sold out. Burbank Pickwick Bowl, January 23rd, Oklahoma City. Bricktown Comedy Club, February 26th, 27th. Kansas City, Royal Oak, Michigan, Waukegan, Illinois. Just go to adamcurl.com for all that. And until next time, oh, Ed Calderon joining us tomorrow. Always good to talk to Ed. Until next time, Adam Kroll for Henrik Fisker and Gina Grandball, Brian saying mahalo.